You guys hear me okay? Hey, so this is kind of like a cruel joke because three old fraternity brothers that I haven't seen in 15 years who just decided to take the front row seat here, so <laughs> I have trouble concentrating. Um, so thank you for having me. It's a real pleasure to be here. I haven't been back to CMU since I graduated um, back in 2004, so it's amazing to see how much things have developed and changed. Uh, since then, and I'm just curious, uh, how many of you guys are students currently and faculty? And how many folks think they want to maybe start a startup or, or be a part of one? So a good number. All right, so in thinking about what to talk about today, there's sort of an abstract version of this talk and there's a more practical application based one. And I thought I would stick closer for the most part to the sort of applications of how we're taking um, some of these technologies and um, utilizing them and commercializing them in, in, in very practical ways. I thought that would be interesting and useful. Um, so Richard sort of mentioned some of these, but here's some of the companies I've been involved with. Uh, Fluid Design we talked about. When I left Carnegie Mellon, I actually went and worked at uh, a hedge fund uh, as, a, as a programmer. Um, for the trading and research systems over at Bridgewater Associates, which is sort of a, a famous, I would say infamous place. That was a really interesting experience. Um, I then started a high-end wallpaper company, actually, which recently got sold, <laughs> random I know. Um, Mojungle was sort of a mobile media sharing platform and early-ish version of Instagram, really, um, and that was sold in 2007. And then I started GumGum, which I've been running uh, for almost 11 years now. And um, a little bit about GumGum, Gum. we're approaching 400 people, a few hundred million dollars in uh, annual revenue. Uh, we have offices around the world, so we're in the UK, in Japan, um, in Canada, in Australia, all throughout the US. And I'll talk more about sort of the applications um, that, that Gum Gum puts out, all of which are driven by uh, AI. And we've raised about $60 million uh, to date from some folks that you guys probably recognize. So a good group of folks there. But before we get into um, the applications, I thought uh, we should talk about this notion of exponential growth and a little bit about uh, AI. Because what I found is that uh, this concept of exponential growth is one that is not very well understood, um, not very well appreciated, but is very consequential, um, especially if you're sort of operating in uh, the technological field. And just to contextualize that, it's, it's actually a, sort of a very simple concept. So if I were to walk uh, across this room and take, say, 30 steps, and each step that I took was one meter in length, after 30 steps, I would have uh, actually walked 30 meters, so I wouldn't have gone very far, but it's what you would expect, and, and that would be sort of a linear trend. If I, however, took 30 exponential steps, starting from this point, and started to walk across the room, by the 30th step, I would have traversed the circumference of the Earth 26 times. And um, if we look at that as sort of a graph, what we see is this is a little bit misleading um, in that the growth rate is very slow. When I talk about exponential growth in this case, it's just a simple doubling. So 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, uh, and so on. But you see here, um, as we sort of approach step 27, things start to really inflect and get very interesting. And if we were to have, say, a linear graph here where every step was 5 or 10 or 100,000 meters for a period of time, it would look like that linear growth was significantly higher than the exponential growth. Um, and often what we do in technology when you're building a company um, is you're trying to predict the future accurately and that is a very difficult thing to do and even say a, a five year period when you're dealing with exponential growth trends. And often what we do is we interpolate based on a point in time or something that happened right before and we try to project uh, where we're going to be. And it's really easy for that to be off. Um, and one example uh, of some of this in action is, uh, this is effectively a graph of, of Moore's law. So this is the doubling of the number of uh, transistors on an integrated circuit every you know, 18 to 24 months. I'm sure you guys are very familiar with that. And 
What's interesting here is if you look at 1980, the computational power that you could purchase for $1,000 was uh, less than the brain of an insect. Uh, by 2023, so in just a few years from now, $1,000 will buy you the computational power, or rather from a calculation per, sec per second perspective, um, uh, of a human brain. And about 25 years after that, uh, we'll be able to buy for $1,000 the equivalent computational power of all human brains on Earth. Um, and that's uh, no small statement. Uh, that's really a testament to um, the power of exponential growth. And it also sort of indicates to us that we're not really increasingly dealing with limitations as they relate to hardware um, and increasingly, you know, software and models and, and algorithms are going to be the thing that enable us to sort of break through because we don't have these fundamental limitations. So to put this into further context, if you were to, you know, look at the smartphone in your pocket, that represents about a uh, trillion dollars in computational value uh, in 1965 dollar terms, uh, inflation adjusted. And um, it's not only sort of integrated circuits that we're talking about, right? If you're talking about sort of memory capacities or ethernet speeds or all these different um, sort of relevant technologies that are growing in exponential terms, um, it's what's creating the situation where the world, um, as we all sort of feel, I think, is changing very rapidly and it's very hard to sort of peek around the corner and, and understand what's coming next because you don't know exactly where we are in each of these trajectories. Um, so to talk about AI for a moment, uh, I think it's useful to, um, to define sort of what we mean when we talk about AI because really there's two forms of this technology that are commonly referred to. And one is uh, ANI or artificial narrow intelligence. Um, that's what my company focuses on. That represents the current real, really state of the art of what's possible with AI. And what we mean there is um, solving tasks uh, in very, very, very narrow ways. So when you hear about, um, you know, neural networks being built that are able to beat uh, humans at, uh, at Go or at chess or at Jeopardy, uh, what you're seeing there is sort of, uh, you know, expression of narrow AI. And these programs can't do anything outside of those very specific tasks, but they can do those things at superhuman levels. Uh, we also, you know, hear about artificial general intelligence or super intelligence, the stuff of sort of Westworld and science fiction. And that's all very interesting in its own sort of talk, I think. But um, for the purposes of this talk, we're really focusing on, on A and I. And... One, I think, relevant question is, what's uh, different this time uh, versus periods in the past? And what I mean by that is there have been various uh, false starts um, with this technology. So back in the 40s and 50s, one of the fathers of, of um, modern AI, one of the people who coined the term was actually a former CMU professor, a guy named Herbert Simon. Uh, and in the 40s and 50s, um, the first neural network was created. It had about, you know, 40 neurons. Uh, but there was a period of a lot of excitement and a lot of investment, and uh, it didn't really yield practical results, and eventually interest waned. And then in the 80s, there was another sort of big push for this technology, lots of investment, and the interest waned, and that was what was referred to as sort of the second AI winter. And, you know, some people will ask, well, why, are, why is it different this time? Why, why are we not going to enter into a third AI winter? And I won't go through all the reasons as to why, um, but I think it's worth noting that the most convincing answer is that this stuff actually works. In other words, it's uh, cost effective, um, it's functional, and you could solve hard problems with it in ways that um, are viable, uh, sort of, uh, you know, at scale. So moving on to, uh, to Gum Gum, the company that I founded, we're particularly focused on uh, computer vision, which is uh, a field of artificial intelligence where we teach computers uh, to sort of see, process, and understand the world, uh, similar to, uh, to the how uh, the human brain does. And um, 
we've applied this technology um, in three sort of different categories, uh, advertising, sports, and healthcare. So I thought it'd be interesting to walk through um, what those applications look like and um, show you uh, sort of how we put this, this technology uh, to use to actually create commercially viable uh, businesses. So uh, on the advertising side, we sort of started in this category. Uh, we invented a form of advertising called in-image advertising. Some of you may have sort of seen that uh, when you're browsing the web. And what that looks like in this case is, you know, we're working with uh, motortrend.com. Uh, we'll actually identify the make, model, and vehicle of the uh, visual content, in this case the image, that appears. Uh, we'll do semantic analysis on the text, and then we'll place our marketing message there in line with the content users are actually engaging with. Um, so, I mean, at this point you might, you might not be liking me for being <laughs> one of the people making your browsing experience more annoying, but um, we do think this is representative of um, what the future of advertising should look like. So if you think about what's happening here, we're returning uh, real estate back to the publisher so that more of the content of the page can be devoted um, to um, actual content versus advertising, um, and very surgically placing marketing messages um, at a point in time when the user is likely to engage with them. Um, and because this is such an effective unit and approach, um, our goal is really to show it as infrequently as possible. So, you know, 10, 15% fill rates, that's sort of our target goal. Um, because it's so effective, we're able to charge significantly more for it. So the sort of economics back out uh, favorably for everyone. Uh, here's another example on rollingstone.com. Uh, we're identifying, you know, Beyonce using facial recognition that is related to sort of the Lion King. And we'll place a marketing message, in this case, what we call an in-screen ad. Um, at the bottom of the screen. So same basic uh, sort of principle there. Um, here's a third example, you don't have to look at it. But we do lots of different sort of uh, advertising creative and the real differentiator for Gum Gum is that we're able to look at visual content, imagery, and video and do really deep analysis on what is happening within that content. So we recognize tens of thousands uh, of objects and we're able to target uh, marketing messages uh, accordingly. And another thing that we do that's pretty interesting is uh, we offer brand safety solutions to, um, to brands. And to my knowledge, we're the only company uh, that actually does anything like this where we're scanning visual content uh, for things like nudity, for plane crashes, for you know, swastikas, weaponry, all the stuff that if you were a brand you wouldn't want to be um, closely associated with and you guys might be aware that a lot of companies have been getting in a lot of trouble for this particular reason because their brands are appearing alongside unsafe content. So we're able to scan a page or a video uh, for this unsafe con content and actually inhibit an ad from showing up um, in real time. And that's something that we've done historically for our clients um, exclusively but now have opened uh, up those capabilities so that any company um, that's advertising on the web or any brand that's advertising on the web could actually leverage um, these capabilities as well. So we work with uh, a lot of the sort of known uh, internet um, from a publisher perspective. We work with about, I think, 70 uh, or 75 percent now of Fortune uh, 100 brands. Uh, and this is a pretty scaled out and, and mature business. Um, a few years ago, we launched uh, another business called Gum Gum Sports, and we were thinking about how could we apply this technology uh, to this category um, in a way that would be impactful. And um, what we do at present uh, with Gum Gum Sports is we use our technology, in this case, to analyze uh, broadcast television. And what we do is we identify every moment when a sponsorship comes into view. We uh, qualify the quality of that moment of exposure across six factors. Um, we combine that with spot rate data and we're actually able to back that into uh, an economic value. Um, and that's really useful because it provides a comprehensive measure across streaming, OTT, uh, broadcast television and social media of um, 
of what kind of ROI is being generated um, from uh, these sponsorship efforts. And um, this industry historically is sort of very archaic. So the way that this is done before Gum Gum was literally snippets of video would be taken, um, sent off, typically offshore. Um, people would code this stuff by hand, maybe 10 minutes of a, of a one or two hour video, and then they would just extrapolate as to what these numbers might look like. And that didn't take into account all of the um, varying consumption channels. And consumption um, of sports content has changed dramatically. A lot of it occurs not on traditional sort of broadcast television. Um, and without utilizing a technology like computer vision, this is really an impossible problem to solve well on television, but really impossible on social media because mm -hmm. you need to be able to effectively find needles and haystacks over and over and over again, quantify the value um, and return. So our turnaround time is, is, is near real time. Um, typically with other companies, it's like uh, six to 12 weeks and about 65%, uh, at least of uh, sort of Generation Z and, and younger are consuming content, um, not in sort of the uh, traditional methods. So we now work with pretty much all the major sports leagues, um, many of the uh, major league teams, and, um, and lots of brands. So this is a rapidly growing business where what we're doing is um, selling uh, this data uh, to both sides, right? So, so to brands and to rights holders. Um, but we're uh, also uh, working very closely with, for, for example, Twitch and eSports. So we're actually valuing the media that's generated on behalf of sponsors on the Twitch platform. We're actually increasingly becoming the ad server. So we're not selling the ads in that case, but we are powering the creative and, um, and the valuations uh, behind that um, for the eSports category. And increasingly, um, are really leading the charge for helping the industry move to a more performance-oriented sponsorship structure. And what I mean by that is, you know, currently you kind of like put your finger up in the wind, take a guess as to what people will be willing to pay, and then charge them that price for a press table. Uh, what we're able to do is make it more performance-oriented. So if you're Coca-Cola and you're sponsoring, um, you know, the Penguins, say, uh, if the Penguins were to make it to the playoffs, then you would pay more for that. If they generate a certain number of engagements on social, you pay more for that. So just make this more equitable and performance oriented, which really incentivizes, um, I think, the right types of incentives that you want to be pushing um, in an environment like that. Uh, here's an example of the methodology that we use. I won't get into this in a lot of detail. You could see uh, what our CV technology is doing is we're looking at things like clarity, prominence, size, share of voice, coming up with what we call a media value percentage, and then combining that with spot rate data in order to come up with an economic value. Um, so this is a pretty cool capability. Uh, we call this white space. And what we're doing here is uh, training on textures that appear in video. And that really could be anything. In this case, it's a, a crowd of people. But that could be you know, a field of grass or a, a parquet floor on a basketball court whatever the case may be. And then we're able to actually track how that texture moves across a video stream. Um, and then we're able to uh, identify sort of the pitch and angle uh, of these textures, which is not an easy problem. And then we're able to create this mask in which you could overlay dynamic content. Um, so to give you an example of what this looks like um, as a finished product, it might be something like this you're able to overlay this marketing message directly into uh, the stream itself. I think there's a significant movement away from uh, traditional television commercials. We've kind of gotten um, trained to, to increasingly um, try to avoid them as much as possible. Um, and the way that this is going to sort of see ex its first expression in market is probably going to be um, in sort of esports platforms where you see um, sort of integrated marketing messages um, that are more than just sort of like a rotating banner. Next up, let's talk about um, Gum Gum Dental. Um, and if this is confusing as to why we went from all this media stuff to sort of healthcare oriented opportunities, is the idea behind Gum Gum was always to sort of develop uh, this technology and apply it widely. Um, when I started the company, it was computer vision focused, but the state of the technology 
wasn't anywhere near what it is today. It's really advanced um, quite dramatically. And um, the way that we approach things is, you know, as we develop these businesses, get them to points of profitability and continue to sort of grow them, we sort of take a very systematic look at the market and choose a new category to tackle. So several years ago, I decided to start uh, collecting dental x-rays. And I didn't know necessarily what we would do with that content, but I thought it would just be a good idea to have, um, to have a, a store of this data. And for several years, we were going to dental offices and asking them for, for their x-rays, and they would share them, and we built up a pretty big base of them. And we've looked at um, all types of different applications of different categories. We looked at agriculture, we looked at um, um, security, and there's lots of opportunity out there. Um, but when we looked at sort of this category in particular, we came to uh, believe that uh, the capabilities that we would be able to sort of offer up to the market really matched up very nicely with where um, that market was headed and its um, willingness to sort of receive uh, some of these capabilities. And one of the insights was that, you know, dental software is just not keeping up. Um, uh, sort of very antiquated technology and um, is not sort of... Uh, something that you can use to provide systemic health analysis across a wide range of practices. And what's happening in dentistry is that this industry is uh, rapidly getting consolidated. Um, sort of a bit of a different topic, but um, basically what's happening is you have private equity firms forming what's called DSOs, which are dental service organizations, and they're gobbling up uh, all the dental offices uh, across the country. And that's rapidly overtaking uh, the category uh, for a variety of reasons. And, you know, when we thought about what dental software could look like with AI and what we'd need to do to be effective in that effort, uh, we thought, well, we need to collect, um, you know, lots of data. We'd have to build a team of expert annotators um, and experienced machine learning engineers, um, train models to detect pathologies and issues, and um, understand the nuances of optimizing this stuff. And it turns out, obviously, that that's what we specialize in doing. We've built a whole infrastructure at GumGum Gum for ingesting any sort of type of data set, um, getting that data labeled and trained and optimized and put into a very scalable infrastructure. Um, so if you look at uh, what this looks like in practice, I can show you guys actually a live demo. So this is a system that we've developed called Second Opinion. Um, this is actually gonna be launched uh, and announced publicly over the next few weeks. So keep your eye out for that. Um, and what we're able to do here uh, is a number of things. So we're able to number teeth. We're able to identify um, 21 different pathologies. Um, so things like bone loss and cavities and anatomy um, and, and all types of sort of, uh, of different pathologies. And you could imagine, you know, you as a patient sitting in the dental chair, your x-rays get taken. And what we do is we immediately populate the results um, for the dentist so that they're receiving a second opinion and you're sort of getting corroboration on, um, on their analysis. And what's interesting um, that what we're able to do here as well is sort of auto chart um, all the data. We're able to look at it in a sort of perennial fashion. Um, if you guys are familiar with medical records, you'll know that they tend to uh, sort of, it's a very sort of messy affair um, where there's sort of notes written everywhere, there's no standardization. And because of that, this data um, is sitting out there in a totally unstructured fashion. And if you have unstructured data, it's really difficult to manipulate it, it's really difficult to query it, and you can't sort of, um, you can't uh, come to conclusions about what the relevant populations look like um, unless this is sort of structured in some way. So what we're doing um, on top of this technology is uh, creating sort of a practice intelligence tool. Um, in this case, uh, there's a variety of applications here that I could talk about, but in this case, we're actually servicing the DSOs that own you know, thousands of dental offices. And what we're doing there is making it so that they can query the data from the patient population so they can make decisions about their business. So for example, um, if you want to invest in a new technology, 
um, and it only applies to patients that have you know bone loss with within three to six millimeters um, typically what you'll do today is you'll make a bunch of phone calls to offices and you'll try to get a sense of what those numbers look like um, but with our system you can obviously just query um, your your database and, and, and find out um, with certainty what that population looks like and understand what your relevant market size is. Um, we're also able to uh, really affect training and ROI in that you have, you know, say thousands of, you know, you know 4,000 practitioners across, you know, a thousand offices. And you see varying um, sort of rates of return and um, differences in diagnoses and treatment plans across all these doctors. And one of the things that really matters to DSOs is to be able to sort of systematize as much as they can these processes so they can maximize patient care and maximize uh, profit as well. Um, and with our system, because we're actually looking at the data itself, uh, data itself and not sort of at tangential indications of what that data might look like, you're able to do this stuff um, uh, very efficiently. Um, so we're already uh, seeing about 97% accuracy for 10 of the top 21 pathologies. Uh, we have thousands of, uh, of dentists around the world that are annotating, uh, annotating this data every single day um, and training the system. It's a pretty monumental um, effort, um, but it also has uh, this characteristic, which I'm sure some of you guys are familiar with, maybe even pursuing yourselves, of um, sort of being winner take all because when you're able to um, get a massive head start uh, with a data set and get it annotated and get it into market in such a way that your customers are actually giving you high quality data back, um, it becomes very, very difficult for any other entity to do that. Um, and that's really the kind of dynamic that you do want to build if you're operating with these technologies. It's one of the, the, the most exciting benefits from a business perspective. Um, and Again, this is so narrow. Um, we're focusing specifically on dental x-rays. Uh, we're moving on after this to CBCT scans, but when we do that, even though we're collecting the data now, it's to give us a little bit of a head start, annotating that data means that we need to start um, from day one with this you know, fresh data set and build it all up again. So what's interesting is that there's so many slivers of opportunity where you can apply this technology in meaningful ways um, it's just that when I look at the world and, and how little this technology has been applied to date, um, you just see a massive amount of opportunity. There's going to be a huge amount of value created by lots of disparate entities because no one company can do too many things that well because you have to invest so much time, effort, and energy getting this technology to work for your particular application. Um, I think what we're going to see is you know, lots of successful startups that have built these mini kingdoms, and I think we're going to see a lot of acquisitions because if you're a larger enterprise, um, you really need to own this position given there's really going to be one winner in most of these categories. And that will be very interesting to, to sort of watch uh, unfold over the next five to ten years. Um, the thing is about some of the applications here, we're currently working on integrating this technology directly into uh, the devices, so x-ray um, machines and also intraoral intra scanners, um, which I'll talk about momentarily. Um, we're working uh, with uh, the insurance industry to um, utilize this capability as sort of a third-party tool that both the providers and the insur insurance companies could agree on so you can streamline the claims process. The most expensive um, component of claims processing, or of the insurance process rather, is sort of putting an expert on a case so that they can determine what the appropriate payout is. And we think that's something that we could uh, help automate. Um, I think there's a lot of direct-to-consumer applications um, and lots more. So what's exciting here is we're building a fundamental technology. It's a fundamental capability and it's really widely applicable um, throughout the entirety of that industry. And this is another thing that we're doing uh, within this category. So this is something that we call smart margin. Um, and this is just uh, a much more esoteric uh, application of the technology, but one that uh, is really powerful and um, really interesting, I think. So what we're doing here is really uh, solving this problem of what's called margin marking for dental laboratories. And what that means is 
If you are a patient and you um, say want to get a restoration like a crown, you go to the dentist, they take an impression, they send that impression to uh, a dental laboratory. Uh, they will design the crown, they'll 3D print it, they'll send it back to the uh, dentist for installation. But prior to being able to design the crown, you need to understand where the new crown sort of meets the, um, the ridge line of the gums. Um, and that's something called margin marking. And that's currently a process that's done by humans. So you have, you know, tens of thousands of humans every single day marking the margin line by hand in 3D CAD programs um, around um, these areas. And that's very slow, it's very expensive, it's very error prone. Um, and it tends to be uh, one of the main bottlenecks that laboratories uh, sort of face. So what we've done is um, use this same technology, uh, or a version of it, to actually automate uh, this process. And you could see, and what you're going to see here is pretty straightforward. It's not like the graphic I showed you, which is you have this 3D model. Um, this is really a 3D mesh. This has a texture on it. And what we're able to do, um, both with something that we call mesh manipulation and um, training uh, on this data, uh, is we're able uh, to automate this. And what's interesting is what we found in market is that different laboratories actually have different subjective preferences as it relates to how they like to mark their margins, um, which was surprising to us. But what's nice about taking a machine learning approach to these problems is that we could actually train on the data sets, um, on the years of data sets um, that have been done by particular labs, and we could sort of match their preferences without having to, to talk much about it. The data can do sort of all the work in the heavy lifting. And you can, here you can see a polyline uh, that we've drawn um, around, uh, around the margin there. So, like I mentioned, we're next sort of moving to CBCT scans, a pretty natural um, extension uh, of the capability. And um, the vision here is really to go beyond x-rays, um, ultimately, and take sort of a multimodal approach where we're able to combine uh, oral health records and sort of body health and marry the two. There's a lot of indications. Um, I think there was a bunch of news recently about, you know, if you have like gingivitis, you're much more likely to develop Alzheimer's and a lot of really cutting edge research around these sort of um, these correlations. So uh, we're working with a number of universities on, um, uh, on developing sort of uh, a system to make those correlations queryable and, um, and, uh, and that's an exciting, uh, exciting effort. And also there's some predictive elements here where we're able to uh, make predictions about, about the future and hopefully help people lead healthier lives. So that's um, what I have for uh, sort of the overview. Hope that made sense somewhat and was interesting. Um, I'm very happy to answer um, any questions that you guys might have um, about any of our business lines or um, the experiences uh, that we've had with the technology or uh, as an entrepreneur in general. Yeah. Yeah. So I just wonder, like, how did you navigate that? I mean, you're Yeah, it's a good question. So the question was how to um, navigate acquiring this data, especially in a category like healthcare, where you have um, all types of confidentiality, confidentiality um, implications, and, and you need HIPAA compliant um, processes and all that. Um, one of the reasons. Frankly, I chose the dental category. Um, a, my father is a retired dentist. Um, but B, my sense, after having um, several years ago actually spoken to a number of universities and other entities about acquiring um, you know, brain tumor data, lung cancer data, stuff like that, many years ago, um, there's a huge amount of sensitivity around that. And there have been data breaches. And everyone is, is very anal, I think, for, for good reason. Um, my sense was the dental category um, would be an easier effort because 
for I think a number of reasons, the criticality level <laughs> and sensitivity around that data goes from like a 10 to, to a 3. Um, so that is just um, a beneficial reality of that category. That being said, we still need to you know, go through HIPAA compliance. We're actually now going through the FDA process, um, which is you know, a significant effort. Um, but what we did initially was, um, and this is sort of instructive, because when you're trying to build an AI-driven startup, so much of what you need to do is you need to acquire good data sets. Um, and typically, you're not going to have much data to start. You need to go to industry and acquire that data somehow. And that's where a lot of sort of scrappy miss and ingenuity uh, and sort of the, you know, ingenuity comes in. So what we did initially was I literally went to my dentist um, and I uh, brought up this, um, this thing that I was interested in doing. Uh, and it turns out uh, another dentist in the office who's kind of this hotshot guy Young lectures around the world. He's like this, like famous dentist who's now works full time at, at Gum Gum uh, as our head of clinical <laughs> affairs. Um, this guy, Dr. Kyle Stanley, check out his Instagram. It's very active. Um, he was really interested in this and very excited about the opportunity. He said, "Like, I'm interested in this. Let me work with you. I have a lot of friends in the industry, and let me give you our data." So we went to to we got their data um, and did it all in sort of by the book and anonymized uh, fashion. And then a lot of other entities were willing to give us their data, but we were going to individual offices initially. Um, and that provided us with a good set, you know, say a few hundred thousand um, uh, data points, but not nearly, uh, uh, you know, achieving the levels that we felt that we needed. So then we did something, which is just, we went to dental offices and we're like, we want to give you a few thousand dollars. We'll come in and pull your data out, we'll anonymize it, and you could contribute to this effort, and we'll give you some other you know, heads up when we develop things. And I didn't know if that would work, but it worked really like a charm. Like everybody said yes. So we were able to buy a bunch of data that way. Uh, and then eventually when we started working with these DSOs, work with thousands of offices, like I mentioned, um, as part of these programs, they're delivering their data set so we can train on it. And now we have tens of millions of records, um, more than we could keep up with from an annotation perspective. Um, so I guess the answer there is like that's not a model to follow. Obviously, it's our it's our experience and what we did to sort of navigate the landscape. And I think every situation um, will be very different. What's unique about this particular type of annotation effort is that it requires actual expertise, right? Um, like you need qualified dentists to mark x-rays, like dental students won't even do for the most part. So that's different than what we've done historically in that we're identifying, you know, casts and sunsets. Like we can throw huge teams of people at that um, and everyone could do it for the most part. But in this case, not only are we needing to get dentists around the world on board to an our annotation platform, but um, we also need to have um, a lot of protocols in place from a quality assurance perspective um, to make sure that the data that we're receiving um, is of high quality. So what we do there is we have multiple um, practitioners look at the same x-rays. If there's a discrepancy, we have a, you know, a sort of scoring system and we have a gold set. And we have tier one annotators and like a whole thing um, that we do to um, really try to make sure that the, the data is very high quality because if it's not, then that will affect uh, the quality of your models. Yeah. How do you stay like plugged in like, in innovation? Because there's everything happens. How do you know what to focus on? Uh -huh. How do you know concentrate your mind? It's a good question. Um, and um, you know, this is not your the way your traditional company will grow. Um, typically, you choose a lane and you stick with it. And I think there's um, there's value in in that approach. We've taken a very regimented approach to. Um, a thesis that we have about the world, which is that this technology has become very powerful very recently, is not yet widely applied. We're in a position to apply it widely because we've built an infrastructure to solve these problems. And we've had to sort of figure out the best way to um, sort of maintain this sort of startup dynamic and, and elements of focus, but also grow the larger enterprise. Um, so the approach that we've taken is uh, 
that we have um, all of these groups within GumGum operating. Each one has a, a general manager, which is typically a domain expert. And all these groups utilize um, sort of the infrastructure at GumGum to the extent that they need to. So things like back office, uh, we have a great marketing team, accounting, all those functions are just handled. Um, and over time, as these businesses mature, what we do is we start to devote resources to them. Um, so sports, when it started, was you know six people or five people ded get dedicated to it, and the rest of the folks um, were just being borrowed from Gum Gum. But now that team is like 60 people, and it's really sort of running a lot of um, a lot of its own business, except for the sort of back office tasks. Um, so that's been our approach, and I think it, it does scale and, and work because if you were to walk around the Gum Gum office, we have multiple floors. And we put the teams together in their own environments such that they are sort of fighting for a very specific goal, but they're part of this larger enterprise where they're able to, to get the benefits uh, of, that, of that scale and those resources as well. Um, and you had a question about risk? Yeah, I mean, like, you personally, like, how do you just, like, I mean, I'm sure as an entrepreneur, you only go to explore the users yourself. They're not like letting the other team. So how do you know, like, oh, why am I going to another site? You know, maybe, like, go into... Let's say you're trying to like look at too hard, hard analysis, like ECG. How do you decide whether to go into that or focus on sports? Like, which of the categories do you first yeah. decide which one to? Because you're you're leading this huge company and you want to like leave some creative space for yourself. So yeah, that's a good question. Um, so I'm a, obviously I'm a fairly risk tolerant person, <laughs> um, and I also have uh, a very um, big ambition. Um, for this company because I believe that um, our thesis is so right, our timing is so fortunate, and luck plays a big role in this as well. And you have to be able to identify when you're sitting in a lucky position with a winning ticket and you want to take advantage of that. So um, you know, we have a lot of really talented folks at GumGum. Gum. I think my role um, has been um, the one of establishing that thesis establishing um, the vision for the company and leading the effort to create um, the systematized approach to actually choose and make decisions about what to pursue and what not to pursue. Um, so we take a very regimented, very business school-like approach to analyzing these different markets, um, but we also want to do things that we're you know, personally interested in. I think that's important. Um, one of the things that I think Richard and I were talking about when he visited was uh, the agricultural ap application. So we were looking pretty deeply into the agricultural category. We were working with UC Davis and, and a big farm in China um, and collecting a lot of data. And one of the things that we were doing, there were actually two things that we were working on doing. One was um, looking at live um, camera feeds within uh, these livestock pens and identifying the well-being of animals because if there's an unwell animal, you want to take them out of the population and treat them because they could infect the whole um, mass. And there's all types of signatures um, that indicate um, sort of whether a hog has the flu and stuff like that. Um, and that was a pretty interesting application. Another application um, was around determining the sex of chickens <laughs> um, because it's, it's a very difficult thing to do, um, to, like sort of discern between male and female chickens. Um, and there's very specialized people that <laughs> go to these farms, and this is the one purpose that they serve. It's a perfect machine learning um, problem. Um, and we were looking at that in conjunction with lots of other opportunities, but it was a very intentional decision at the time that we are ready to pull on sort of another category. And we only do that when we're in a position of um, substantial sort of stability and pro enough profitability such that we can reliably do it and spend a lot of time and money and, um, and, and not sort of negatively affect the business, at least not too much. Um, and ultimately, um, obviously decided to, to go down the dental path. Yeah. So what would be your advice for um, a student or uh, thinking about starting uh, that goes into uh, machine learning? Uh, the advice? Yeah. Yeah. 
It's a hard question. There's a lot of things that are really hard about building successful startups. Um, I would say team is critical. Um, like, for example, the CTO that we hired at GumGum Gum is still the CTO of GumGum Gum today. We have a very long-standing team. I think on some level we've been a little bit lucky in that a lot of our folks uh, that were brought on early on in, in the company's sort of existence have been able to scale. Um, and, you know, if you're... What, the way I see a lot of um, first-time founders sort of making mistakes is in who they choose to partner with as a co-founder. Um, I see this all the time. And actually, when I started GumGum, Gum, I had a co-founder, and it was the same exact kind of mistake. Uh, and that person uh, is smart, talented, actually runs a, a company called Clutter now. They just raised money, like a, like a $200 million uh, round from SoftBank, and they're doing really well. The problem with with our dynamic and the problem that I see generally is that we were far too similar. Like we had the ideas about the vision. We both were very, um, we just, just had a very similar skill set and we weren't complimenting each other at all. And I see that all the time because you tend to gravitate towards people where you feel um, that sort of um, connection to because of similarities. But that, those tend to be the wrong people to start companies with unless the roles are very clearly defined and unless you could look at the person that you're working with and like be very thankful for them being there because they're contributing something that's far better um, than you're able to. Um, so having these complementary sort of team dynamics I think is um, something that only gets more appreciated when people have sort of experienced the other side of it and I think um, that's a really important piece of advice. Um, if you're talking about data, um, certain, uh, sorry, if you're talking about AI then certainly data um, is king, like that is the differentiator, you know, if you look at all the work that we do, like the white space product I showed you guys where we're integrating um, content into videos is actually uh, more complicated than what we're doing on the radiological side. That's actually a more straightforward com computer vision type of problem, but acquiring that data was much more difficult. Um, acquiring it, you know, a new company acquiring that data uh, would be a difficult thing, and that's how we have sort of a lot of defensibility around it. Um, and I think another thing that um, is important to keep in mind is, uh, or to get good at, is if you're building a company, um, there tends to be a lot of anxiety around it um, for a lot of good reasons. You're taking on capital, a lot of folks are relying on you, you want to succeed and not fail, um, and that anxiety could last for years, right? Even when you're doing well, it's like still there. Um, so I think um, like taking care of yourself um, and being thoughtful about just treating yourself well ultimately really serves the company as well. You don't want to be like a ball of stress every single day, stressing about it. Like, and you could easily live that reality. Um, but there's so much, I mean, it's, it's such an, uh, a rewarding sort of lifestyle because um, it's so varied that you wear so many different hats and you get to come do things like this and do a hundred things after it that are all different. Um, so I think if you are fundamentally drawn to it, this is absolutely the kind of thing you should pursue. But I think if you're not doing it for the right reasons, um, if you're doing it because um, you think it sounds sexy, you think you're gonna make a lot of money, there's like probably easier ways to make a lot of money um, that are, have a higher likelihood of success. So. I mean, probably didn't answer your entire question, but some thoughts. Yeah. Uh, staying along that thought, what do you do to maintain that balance in your life? I know that uh, I'm not doing something now that seems like it consumes a lot of my time. Yeah. How do you strike your balance with your time and your personal goals? That's a good question. Um, and, you know, it, it's different. Like now we're a company of several hundred people, and there's a lot of luxuries that didn't exist before. Um, so on some level it's easier to strike that balance now. Um, but I think, uh, I think exercise is actually very important. Um, and, uh, you sort of develop an ability, or I felt that I had to develop an ability to just be able to like disassociate, um, some part of your life from business and not let it, um, be the thing that is controlling your mood at all times. And I think that 
over time you just develop that out of necessity and you're able to just like disengage and unplug. Um, what I personally do is I do, uh, I do woodworking. So I have a big wood shop that I built at my house. It's shocking to me that I got into this. Um, like one day I woke up and I was like, I'm going to carve a spoon. And like eventually I just like built a whole wood shop and I just like spent all this time on YouTube, uh, like watching woodworking videos and <laughs> learning about it. But that's a really, um, I think, instructive in that I find sort of a flow state in that. It's very meditative and you're really just focused on like whatever it is you're doing at that moment in time. And I think, you know, whether that's sports or, um, or you know, video production or freaking knitting or whatever it is, it doesn't matter as long as it's serving that purpose. Um, and I think it's really important to have that, that personal thing. We're also, you know, I went from this position of building a lot of stuff myself to getting to a point where like everybody around me was better at building stuff than me. So I don't really build anything anymore with my own hands. Um, and getting back to that and sort of producing something from start to finish was an important thing for me, for me personally to do. Um, so it really depends on sort of what you're interested in, but I think prioritizing it um, is important. Yeah. Uh, there's this idea that breakthroughs come from researchers who have kind of left alone for as long as it takes to get that dream moment, and then maybe there's a tension between uh, that and a business that has to roll something out, mm -hmm. and people begging a quarter. So how do you, do you believe that tension exists, and if so, how do you the tension definitely exists when you're solving hard problems. That tension is very defining for, for gum gum, really, because um, we're doing things that haven't been done before. Um, for example, like this margin marking thing that I was showing you guys, I mean, that's um, applying sort of neural network models to you know, 3D environments, which is um, a much harder type of problem and just like less well-researched. So you know, a lot of what you're doing um, is going out to market, selling things in some cases that don't yet exist or that are not yet ready for prime time, understanding whether or not um, uh, there's, a, there's a market uh, appetite for it and relying on the team and pushing the team to sort of get it done. And, and that, that uh, is a skill set. Um, you don't want to overdo it. I'm sure you guys have been watching this like Theranos stuff and listening to the, to the dropout or whatever. Um, so there's obviously an extreme, extremely bad way to do that. But the whole fake it till you make it thing, unfortunately, is a complete reality of every startup. I mean, that is the definition of a startup. Right? You are faking it until you make it. And you have to understand uh, and be able to react to the market ahead of putting three years into developing something. Um, so uh, you know, if you're developing some sort of back-end enterprise software and it's just like a lot of software that needs to be built, that's a very different type of, of um, problem than one that is more research-oriented. We have lots of PhDs at GumGum -Gum trying to solve lots of hard problems. Um, and we just try to toe that balance. Before we get one more question, yeah. some of the other students have to go to class. Sure. Let me thank Stephen. Oh, God. I sent you a framed token of our I'm going to give this to my mom. Just give it to your mom. And, there, and the video will be available on the web. You can tell <coughs> your mom to point okay. it out. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you so much for coming. So yeah. those of you have to go to class. Yeah, yeah go to class. And if I just want to stick around. Yeah, if you have any questions, I'll be around. And sure, my pleasure. i got to go to a meeting. But All right, man. Thank you so much. Thank you.